Good evening there, everybody. What is happening? Hopefully you all are having a wonderful day today. So when it comes down to it, I thought that I would talk about this video uh, in this subject that, of course, I thought would be very particularly interesting. For those of you, of course, that check out my channel uh, every once in a while, or for those of you that have been around the channel long enough, you know that, of course, I like to talk about tennis. And I kind of talked about this subject the other day, the day of when Novak Djokovic ended up beating that of Daniel Medvedev for his 24th title. Of course, his fourth title within that of the U.S. Open. And although Novak Djokovic, he didn't win the Wimbledon this year, which was a title that he probably should have won, but... I don't think that he expected Carlos Alcaraz to be as competitive and as tough and as much of a thorn in his side as what he was. Um, but, you know, in my view, it pretty much ended up for the better because had he won that Wimbledon title, I'm not sure if Novak Djokovic would have had the same dangerous mentality uh, or desperation to win the title in that of the U.S. Open. And in my view, it probably was better for him to win that of the U.S. Open title anyway because Novak Djokovic then he could be tied right there with Rafael Nadal. Uh, he would be one short, I believe, of Roger Federer. Or maybe Roger Federer, maybe he only had four U.S. Open titles. I thought he had five uh, Australian Open titles and five U.S. Open titles. But maybe I'm wrong about that. I would have to look at that. Uh, I would have to count it in my head, but I, well, we'll talk about that later. Anyways, uh, Novak Djokovic, of course, was able to win the Roland Garros and also that of the U.S. Open this year on top of that of the Australian Open. And Novak Djokovic, he just holds so many records and so many accomplishments at this point. The question is about Mr. Novak Djokovic is that is the GOAT debate officially over? And not even just in terms of men's tennis. And once again, I don't like to interject men's and women's tennis or men's and women's sports because they usually do different things. For example, in women's tennis, it's not the best of five, it's the best of three. So it's whoever gets the two sets first. Uh, when it comes down to it. And usually within most circuits, not, not including tennis though, usually the men's competition has on average been tougher depending on the sport. However, tennis of course is one of those rare sports where the females of course, or the female competitors, where they've also had a great amount of competition as well. Throughout that of the 2000s and 2010s, of course you had both the Williams sisters, you had that of Maria Sharapova, uh, you know, you had that one girl from Romania, uh, although I can't remember her name, you know, and a multitude of other very decent champions. So uh, they certainly deserve a great amount of credit as well. But anyways, when we talk about who is the all-around greatest tennis player of all time, even if you were going to compare Novak Djokovic to Serena Williams and Steffi Graf and Margaret Court or Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer, Rod Laver, whoever the hell else you want to compare him to, in my view, just in my personal view, Novak Djokovic beats all those guys. But it's very interesting because um, Novak Djokovic has really kind of had to fight uh, a lot of the narratives that have been going against him now, probably for the past 10 plus years. And I think that that's been going on for a multitude of reasons. I think that a part of it is because Novak Djokovic came up in the middle of that Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer era. And of course, he's not a Nike asset like either of those guys are. Not me saying, of course, that he's not maybe bought off by other sponsors, but Nike is pretty much the kingpin uh, when it comes to bought off assets, you know, and them trying to spread messages uh, to that of the mass of people in order to convince them of certain ideologies. Novak Djokovic goes against the grain a little bit at times. Novak Djokovic at one point in time stated that he believes that the men should get paid more uh, because I believe that they earn more money. Of course, they did not like that. <laughs> the, you know, the Americans, of course, especially would not like that because that goes against their liberal ideologies. And of course, he also didn't get the COVID-19 vaccine. And they pretty much, you know, raked him over the coals with that. You know, so Novak Djokovic. Uh, and once again, I'm not saying maybe that he's not bought off in certain other areas. But one thing I'll say about Novak Djokovic is that, you know, at least a certain amount of the times he goes by his own opinion and his own mindset. And I have to give him a great amount of respect for that especially in today's age, you know, so I have to give him a great amount of credit for that. But anyways, we're going to talk about, in my view, Novak Djokovic's career and what, in my view, makes him the greatest player of all time compared to the other two, especially of Rafael Nadal and that of Roger Federer. And if there is anyone still in the conversation with Novak Djokovic, who maybe deserves to be there? So let's get straight into it.
but we'll start with that breaking night, record-breaking night, I should say, in New York as Novak Djokovic lifted his 24th Grand Slam singles title. No man or woman has now won more slams than Djokovic, who wakes up today back as the men's world number one. Yeah, the records just continue to tumble so much, in fact. There's not many left for Djokovic to break now. And it does beg the question, has the so-called GOAT debate really been put to bed once and for all? I'm joined by Britain's former Davis Cup winner, Domingo. When you just ask me personally, do I think that the GOAT conversation has been put to end at least forever? We'll see, because once again, you never know uh, who's going to come up. I never like to say that the GOAT debate is put away forever. But of course, I, I know what they're trying to say. Listen, if you're just talking about comparing him to his contemporaries and comparing him to a multitude of other tennis players, yes, in my view, it pretty much is over I just don't really see what other record Novak Djokovic would really need in order to become the undisputed greatest of all time. Novak Djokovic pretty much is that of the Floyd Mayer the Jr. or the Michael Jordan or the Tom Brady of his sport because he's clearly above everyone else, not just in terms of, you know, most talent. Uh, certain people, of course, would say that Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal were more talented than Djokovic. I don't think that I can agree with that because if they were more talented than Novak Djokovic, then Novak Djokovic wouldn't have the leading record over both of those players. Just in my personal view, I think that when you talk about talent, that Novak Djokovic is even above both of those guys because there's just no apparent weaknesses in his game. Uh, and on top of that, Novak Djokovic, you can debate that in terms of all-around skills that he's just better than those two players. And there's a reason why he has the leading head-to-head -head record over both of those players, more grand slams, more weeks and more days at the number one spot. So Novak Djokovic, in my view, yes, he clearly would be, at least at the moment, at the clear number one pound for pound spot. Look, I suppose, Don, we'll cut to the quick straight away. Can we unambiguously say now that this man, Novak Djokovic, is the greatest of them all? I think it's tough to, you know, really argue any differently. He's won the most Grand Slams or joint most Grand Slams with Margaret Court. He's got the most Masters Series events. I mean, he's just dominating on a different level and... I know a lot of people will love Federer, they'll love Nadal, but I think he is it. Yeah, Ugh, hard to argue, it really is. So how? You know, whenever you hear people talk about Novak Djokovic, they're always like, I think it's very hard to debate, or I think that, you know, more than likely he is. There's never anyone in the media, at least from what I see, that says he's for sure the GOAT, and it's not even a conversation. Don't even, uh, you know, try to say that anyone else is the GOAT, otherwise you're completely delusional. You know, you, it wouldn't even make sense to make an argument that way. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't really like that mentality, because I think that's kind of a mob or a cult mentality. But it's just very interesting, because whenever it came to Serena Williams, or, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever it came to Roger Federer, or whenever it comes to certain other players that ESPN or a certain amount of the media or sports media really loves to push, uh, like that of a LeBron James or Serena Williams or or that of a Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer, uh, isn't it very interesting how much they really push those guys and try to brainwash you into thinking that they're clearly you know the best thing ever since sliced bread? And don't get me wrong, all those guys are all-time great for what they did. But it's just very interesting. It goes to show you that there's a further narrative afoot or that they're doing it for an apparent reason. Because uh, if, you, if you were to say uh, overall on live TV that, in your opinion, that Serena Williams was not the greatest female tennis player of all time, you would have thousands upon thousands of fans, not just fans, but media members attacking you on that of live air. Uh, you would not be able to even walk to your house without possibly getting death threats. But if someone, uh, and, and, and let me also state this, it is debatable whether Serena Williams is the greatest female tennis player of all time. She does not have the most amount of Grand Sams in that of the open era. She doesn't have the most amount of days at number one. And on top of that, her Grand Slam count is comparable with both Steffi Graf and Margaret Court. So if you were to debate any of those ladies at the number one pound for pound spot, I don't really have a problem with it, you know, but it's just very interesting because if someone were to go on live air, no matter where it is, ESPN or, you know, no matter where it may be, and they were to say, well, I think that Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal is personally over Novak Djokovic, no one would blink an eye. No one would say anything. So it just goes to show you the power that the media, the manipulation of the media that they truly have. Press, were you with him? Last night, we, we'll get on to how good his figures are across his career, but specifically last night, some of our viewers may well have been tucked up in bed. 
Yeah, he's exceptional. I mean, he started the match so strong, really came out firing. Very easy first set. The second set is where it all started really kicking off. And yeah, that second set. And let me tell you what, if you're not a tennis fan or if you're not a person that likes to watch tennis like me, you certainly miss some great matches in this U.S. Open. The Daniel Medvedev and Carlos Alcaraz match was a very good one. Now, of course, it wasn't really like a classic five-setter or anything like that. But you have to really appreciate Daniel Medvedev's performance against that of Carlos Alcaraz. And even though, of course, he lost in straight sets to Novak Djokovic, you also have to really appreciate some of the things that he did against both of those guys. Because Daniel Medvedev was able to completely outperform that of Carlos Alcaraz. And the way that he did that was not only cutting off Alcaraz at the net, but he was not afraid to hit winners against that of Carlos Alcaraz. A lot of these guys... And a big part of the reason why Novak Djokovic lost to Wimbledon against, <clears throat> excuse me, lost to Wimbledon against that of Carlos Alcaraz is because Novak Djokovic, a lot of the times, just like other all-time great champions, sometimes they don't really have to do anything particularly, uh, you know, special in order for them to win a match. They just have to counter your mistakes. They just wait for you to make a mistake. And then they just make sure that their mistakes, you know, aren't as big as yours or that they don't accumulate as much as yours. However, Carlos Alcaraz, uh, he was so consistent throughout the Wimbledon. And I think it really surprised Novak Djokovic. I don't think that he had ever seen a player like that ever in his life, you know. And even he said that after the match or he said, you know, uh, well, Carlos Alcaraz, you know, a lot of people compare him to Nadal. But I think he has a mix of all three of us, of course, meaning himself. Federer and uh, Nadal and what he meant by that was basically saying that he had never seen a player like Carlos Alcaraz before. Carlos was very consistent. He was very skilled. He had great conditioning in that Wimbledon final and Novak Djokovic, I don't think that he was quite mentally prepared for that. So I think it surprised him a little bit. But Daniel Medvedev, he did exactly what he needed to do in order to beat Carlos Alcaraz in the final and he tried, you know, uh, pretty hard in that of the final against Novak Djokovic, but Novak Djokovic, because of his intelligence, his experience, and his nerves of steel, it was just a little bit too much for that of Daniel Medvedev. And Daniel Medvedev, once again, he is going to go down as one of the all-time great gatekeepers in terms of sports history, just in my personal view. Like I said, and what I mean by all-time great gatekeeper, I mean a guy that is not able to consistently be the number one guy, but if you're just below that possible number one guy status, he can probably beat you. So he can beat the Spheres of the world. He can beat, you know, the Stefano Sitsipasas of the world. He can beat the Casper Roods. You know, he can beat that of the Holger Roons, at least at the moment. But the Carlos Alcarazes, the Djokovic's, the Rafael Nadal's, he can beat those guys. It's just never going to be consistently. You know, just like in boxing, uh, Miguel Cotto gave Pacquiao and Mayweather and Canelo, you know, pretty much a handful in all those fights mainly. But he can never beat those guys. But if you were a Shane Mosley you know, or a Joshua Clotty or, you know, other guys, he was going to beat you. You know, there's just certain guys that are like that. You know, in MMA, Dustin Poirier or Justin Gagey, they're two of those fighters. You know, they can never become the main champion, but if you were right below that status, they'd beat the crap out of you, you know. So every sport has one of those guys. Yeah, we just see that. And in the 2000s, it was Anthony or Andy Roddick, whatever his name was. I can't remember. Half volley that you're just showing right now. That came at a break point at 3-4. That would have been a massive game-changing moment. He saved the set point as well. I mean, he looked like his you know, game was up because he was so tired in the second set. But he comes through. He always finds a way. And he's just got that winner's mentality, that, that fighter's mentality that he never goes away. And he's just exceptional. He is absolutely exceptional. And what we've done is we've drawn up this. This is a seemingly never-ending list of amazing statistics that Novak Djokovic now holds. How many of those trophies has he had in his career over, over just this pure... Let me also state this. Novak Djokovic next year, it's going to be very revealing to see at what point in time he's at in his career. I already stated this. In my view, Novak Djokovic, he clearly is starting to show signs of age i don't think that the his grand slam finals were as impressive this year as what they had been in the past like i said that first set against daniel medvedev barring that of the french open against casper Ruud, because unfortunately i did not get to watch that one that was the most dominant set or the most impressive set in my view that he had had at least in a winning effort or when he won a grand slam this year 
I was not really super impressed with him against Stefano Tsitsipas in the Australian Open. Uh, in the French Open, once again, I missed it. Uh, and even a little bit in the Wimbledon, he showed a little bit of age. And listen, he's 36 years old. The fact that he's still the number one player uh, of this year at 36 years old, even with someone like Carlos Alcaraz still creeping on him, and these guys like Daniel Medvedev, it shows you, uh, you know, his level of experience and his level of IQ. Era of dominance that he's had, 24 Grand Slams. Which of these stands out the most to you? I mean, the most weeks at number, world number one, 390. I think tournaments, when you look at tournaments sometimes, you've just got to perform over the course of one week if it's a Masters Series, two weeks if it's a Grand Slam. But to be world number one, you need consistency day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. And that's what he's been doing. It's actually exceptional. Um, that's the thing that's really most impressive to me. Not just the world number ones, but the fact that he's been able to win the most amount of Grand Slams and still stay at the number one spot. I mean, that's like basically an NBA player uh, winning NBA championships and repeatedly winning the MVP day in and, you know, pretty much year after year. You know, kind of like that of Michael Jordan when he won his five MVPs. That's why I compare Novak Djokovic to Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, you know, Floyd Mayer the Jr., all those guys. Because Novak Djokovic, in my view, he's right on their level because it's not like he just leads in grand slams. He leads in almost every major statistic. The only the only things that he really doesn't lead in, uh, I think, is maybe the most amount of titles in certain Grand Slams. Uh, you know, like he doesn't have the most amount of Wimbledon titles, although he could if he wins the next two. So we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, but the only titles, the, excuse me, major statistics that he doesn't lead in is that of the most amount of career titles, I believe. Uh, and maybe a couple of other stats. But other than that, no, Novak is pretty much leading uh, the statistical race and the accomplishment race in pretty much every category. And the funny thing is, some of the players, they get these little sort of insignia. And once again, it's very interesting that Novak Djokovic, that he can lead in pretty much every single stat like that. And certain people, a lot of people in the media or in the news, are still saying, oh, well, you know, I, I still see Roger Federer you know, as the greatest of all time, where I see this person, you know, debatably above him, and no one bats an eyelash. But if you were to say that about Serena Williams, a girl that does not even have the most amount of Grand Slams within history or even within women's history and does not even have the most amount of days at number one, I believe, I'm not even sure if she has the most career titles, you know, p people would go berserk. <laughs> they would try to kill you. Is on their bags of all the titles he, he's won from the Masters. He'd need a and big bag. He'd need a big... I think he's going to run out of space. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have to have a traveller's rucksack on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the one that jumps out at me, and I know we're focusing on the hard courts of the US Open, and he's a genius on the, the courts at the Australian Open, but Wimbledon title seven, he's just one short of Roger Federer. He wasn't particularly good at grass at the start of his career, so that's one that I find really intriguing. But right... Just my view, Novak Djokovic is probably the greatest hardcore player of his era. I don't think that there's really much debate about that. In my view, he also would be the best grass court player of his era, whether he wins more titles than Roger Federer or whether he doesn't. And there's been certain people in the comment section that have said, well, that's not really fair because Roger Federer, he's won more Wimbledon titles and all this other stuff, blah, blah, blah. And his percentage of winning is higher. And all that's fair. But if we're also going to go there, and it's no offense against Roger Federer, but the majority of his titles came in an era where, in my view, there just wasn't that many standout players. I mean, you had Rafi Nadal and... You know, you had Anthony or Andy Roddick, whatever his name was, and I'm sure a couple of other players. But if you weren't really around during that era, please, please name me about five great players from that era other than Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. Maybe Anthony Roddick or Andy Roddick, whatever his name is. I think it's Andy Roddick, you know, and maybe like one or two more. But to be honest with you, I can't even name any more than that. Novak Djokovic was in the golden era of tennis at the beginning of the 2010s. Not only did he have to deal with Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer, but you had Stan Wawrinka, you had Andy Murray, you had Silic, or you know whatever that one Croatian's name was, you had Martin Del Potro or Potro, you know however you pronounce his name. You had all those guys. Like all those guys at one point in time were pretty good, massive contenders. Like it's no offense against Roger Federer, but <laughs> you know who did he really have around? And it's not that, you know, it's not that Roger Federer was not a great tennis player, but. You know, certain people may say, oh, well, that's not fair. 
you know, because you can say the same thing about Novak Djokovic right now. Well, in my view, the era right now would be more competitive than what it would be for the past Roger Federer era in that of the mid-2000s. Because when you take a look at it, it's not like Roger Federer was just so dominant that he had a winning record over everyone. Because the only great player or truly all-time great player other than Roddick that he played against in the 2000s, he didn't even have a winning record against. He he lost the majority of the matchups to Rafael Nadal. Sometimes needed not even just on clay court. So once again, you know, that's the thing about Roger Federer to me. And Roger is an all-time great player. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it wrong. Uh, but when people try to always argue this, oh, Novak is in the weakest era of tennis, it always cracks me up because if we're actually talking about the weakest era of tennis, when we talk about the dominant train, it probably was Roger Federer. That's that's why I compare Roger Federer to that of Shaquille O'Neal. Because Shaquille O'Neal, everyone always says how dominant he was. And don't get me wrong, you know, Shaq was dominant when there was still great players, you know, like Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, and Tim Duncan, and Kevin Garnett, and Dirk Nowitzki. But when you just talk about his position, there was no centers to compete with him whatsoever. That was a great power forward era where they had Tim Duncan and Kevin Garnett and Dirk Nowitzki, you know, and Chris Webber. That was a great, great power forward era. There was no centers, no other great centers of that era to compete with Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, who else was there? Like, you know, who? Yao Ming? You know, Vlade Divac? Like, get the fuck out of here. You know, like, that's why I compare him to Roger Federer. Everyone always mentions about how Roger had the most amount, you know, the longest streak of, you know, at number one, all this other shit. Well, of course he did. Who was there? <laughs> it's no offense. Down the bottom, you see that winning record against Federer and Nadal. So this is combined figures of his results against those other two that would compete with him for the men's goat, at least. And he's come out on top. Yeah, I, you have to if you're going to win that many Grand Slams. And he's faced them so many times in the semis, in the finals of these Masters series, and especially the Grand Slams. And, and he's come up, as you said, on top. But really, we could look at any of these. The Australian Open titles, 10 over there. You know, it's just, just a domination. And, uh, you know, he's still got more. That's the thing about it. It's what's scary. We haven't seen the end of him yet. No, we certainly haven't. 36 years young. Last night, chalked off another record as well. He went past Ken Rosewall as the... Well, I certainly don't think that he's 36 years young. Novak Djokovic right now looks like he is starting to age. Now, like I said, I think Novak Djokovic's goal, I think what he's going to try to do is not only break the most amount of all-time records in terms of the all-time, who has the most amount of titles. Uh, Jimmy Connors and Roger Federer, I believe, are the only two players that are ahead of him in that category. But Novak Djokovic is also, in my view, he's going to legitimately try to go for 30 grand slams. And if anyone has a chance at it, I would say that he does. But I don't think he's going to quite get there because, first of all, I don't even know how he's going to look next year. Novak Djokovic, he may not even win a single grand slam next year. And certain people, you know, they'll take a look at me right now and they'll say, what the hell are you talking about? He just won three out of the four grand slams. And that's very true. But you never know sometimes with these players or with these athletes. One year they'll win the Super Bowl, and then the next year they kind of fall off. You know, like Peyton Manning at one point in time, he was very good one season. Then the next year, he was just completely off. Like, he was done. He was washed. So you just you just never know with some of these guys. But we'll see. I predict Novak Djokovic to win at least one or two Grand Slams next year. Uh, so we'll see. But, you know, in terms of possibly reaching 30, I, I'd give him about probably about a 10 to 20% chance list winner of the the u.s open at 36 he says he shows no sign of wanting to slow down which is frightening for the rest of the field this is well novak djokovic is you know he he's showing no signs of wanting to quit but you know in terms of slowing down he is showing some signs of slowing down you know his stamina clearly is not quite as good as what it once was and i get it the man is 36 years old there's been a multitude of uh, matches this year where he's tired out a little bit he did tire out a little bit against Carlos Alcaraz in that Cincinnati championship. And it could have been because of the heat. There was a person that pointed out that Novak Djokovic does have a little bit of a problem in a little bit more of heated matchups. Now, I would have to do a little bit more research to see how true that actually is. Because there's been other hot matches where Novak seems to do just fine. It could be that or it could just be that the man is 36 years old. I don't know. But even in this matchup against Daniel Medvedev, and Daniel was doing his best to make sure that the exchanges were long. So he, he was actually kind of winning the war of attrition and conditioning at certain points. 
but had that been a prime Novak Djokovic, I'm not sure if he would have seen him panting as much as what he was in that matchup. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. The statistic from... Because Novak Djokovic, at times, he will <laughs> he will kind of play it off as if he's exhausted or that, you know, he's on the ropes and then all of a sudden he pulls out like a right cross from left field. You know, he's able to pull out the next two sets or something like that. So, you know, it's not kind of, you know, something completely new. But just in my view, uh, Djokovic did look his age this year. But we'll see. Because if he's able to last, you know, possibly at the number one spot, even for two to three more years, he has a great chance at becoming a 30-time Grand Slam champion. Most Grand Slam titles. And this is one that for years we've been talking about Serena Williams trying to match. Looks like that's not going to happen now. But Djokovic has matched Margaret Court for Grand Slam wins in the Open Era. How far do you think he can go? I think he can definitely get a one or two more. Again, we saw the Australian Open. I definitely think Novak Djokovic can get one or two more Grand Slams. And this guy obviously thinks the same thing that I do. At the end of the day, Novak Djokovic is 36 years old. Now, he might last a little bit longer uh, than Nadal or Roger Federer. We'll see. But it's going to be very interesting because the fact, the fact that Novak Djokovic is actually still at the number one spot, it, it's really quite interesting. Because, you know, in tennis, you can kind of win the Grand Slams and still sometimes not be the number one guy. Now, of course, to be fair, Novak is winning three out of the main four. So it's hard not to be the number one player when you're winning three out of the four. But there's been times where guys have won at least two of the Grand Slams and they've not been ranked the number one player. So the fact that he's not only winning the majority of the Grand Slams, but still being ranked as the number one player, it's quite astonishing. And in my view, Novak Djokovic, he more than likely is going to try to break the record at the ATP Finals. Uh, that's the, probably the record that he's going to go after next. And then after that, the most singles titles. And then, of course, he's going to try to go for 30 Grand Slams. That, in my view, is what Novak Djokovic is going to go after. And he has a real chance at all of those besides maybe uh, the 30 Grand Slams. Like I said, I give him about a 10 to 20% chance on that. He's just dominant there. when he, everyone... And let, let me also state this. If it were not for, you know, martial law with, with that COVID-19 vaccine bullshit, uh, you know, and a couple of other things, like when the Wimbledon was closed down in 2020 because of COVID... Novak easily right now would have 26 Grand Slams. No doubt about it. No, it's only go to Australia. It's Jocko, tough to get look past him. So he could easily look at one there. French Open is going to be tough. We're going to see Alcaraz really producing the goods. And all these players keep coming. The one thing I would say is that we did see levels of fatigue creeping into his match yesterday in that second set. Someone like Medvedev can really wear him down by making loads and loads of balls. So... In the heat of Australia, on the slow courts of you know Roland Garros, is that going to become more and more of, an, of a problem for him, potentially? But remember that was such a hard guy to face at times too, because the man is <laughs> the man is basically a giraffe. I've heard other people, of course, you know, compare him to an octopus, you know, which is kind of interesting. But uh, <laughs> you know, I get it. The thing is about Medvedev is that he's not only a great all-around player, but the man is like six foot six, and I don't know what his arm reach or arm length is. But the man can reach balls, uh, you know, on the court that other people are not able to do. The only thing about Daniel Medvedev is that I wouldn't say that he's quite the supreme athlete as what a prime Nadal or Federer or Djokovic or Carlos Alcaraz are. He's not quite the prime athlete as those guys. He doesn't quite have the quick twitch or the, you know, the quickness in his step as those guys. But it almost doesn't matter at times because his, his reach and his anticipation of reading certain balls at times, it's up there with almost anybody. So Medvedev, you know, make no mistake about it. Yeah, this was a three-setter, but he was giving Djokovic hell, especially in that second set. Still think he could maybe notch up one or two. Yeah, the... The eye test would tell me that Roger Federer has more natural ability. When R Rafa Nadal was so young, it looked like he would be the preeminent one to rival Federer as a, a future goat or anything like that. But is Djokovic... Yes, and that's why a lot of people didn't like Novak Djokovic, because they had already gotten comforted with the idea that, okay, this is the new kid upcoming on the block. And I'm sure that Roger Federer fans, that they didn't like him at first, but they kind of eventually, you know, learned to like Nadal. But then Novak Djokovic came out of nowhere and they were like, who the hell is this guy? You know, and, and why are people claiming him to be the next greatest of all time? 
you know, no way he's going to win as many titles. So, you know, they're just overhyping this dude. And then eventually when he started winning those titles, they grew an even more bitter taste for him because he was a huge interruption. He was basically the redheaded stepchild that came in out of nowhere and was never accepted by the family as much as what the natural born brothers were. You know, that's what Novak Djokovic actually was. Consistency over the years, evidence that hard work beats natural talent. I have to say every single one of those. Well, it isn't just hard work. Once again, you you can't beat guys like Roger Federer or Rafi Nadal if you don't have a similar level of talent. And not only does Novak Djokovic have a similar level of talent, he's probably more talented than those guys. Like I said, Novak Djokovic, when you talk about his forehand, his forehand is comparable with anybody's. His backhand is probably the best of the era, at least debatably, at least the most consistent. When you talk about the serve, he debatably has the best serve out of all of those players. You know, when you talk about the foot speed, I would say that probably Nadal beats Djokovic just by a little bit. But Djokovic's anticipation of where the ball is going to go, it's better than any one of those players. Guys, is it hard working? I mean, and his level of IQ. They are maybe not showing it sometimes on the court, even on the practice courts of these tournaments. But I've heard all the stories about what's going on behind the scenes. And these guys are putting in the hard yards. Djokovic, I mean, obviously, his physical capabilities, the work he puts in to make sure that he's limber, he's loose, he, he looks like he could go on forever. He's Mr. Elastic. That is a talent in itself. And yes, maybe he hasn't got the kind of the strokes that we see from a Federer that is so you know, eye-catching, but... He's just as talented, and it's the men. Well, you can look more eye-catching, you know, than that of another player, but still be less skilled. And certain people aren't going to really understand what I mean. Nick Kyrgios, for example. Nick Kyrgios is probably one of the better talents within that of tennis history. There are certain shots or certain things that, you know, he does that look flashy that certain other players cannot do. Like, he can do certain plays that Daniel Medvedev cannot do. Is he a greater or more skilled player than Daniel Medvedev? Absolutely not. And the thing is about Roger Federer and Nadal. Now, of course, they're all Grand Slam champions, but are they more skilled than Novak Djokovic? No, they're not. You know, people always try to make this argument about, oh, well, you know, Novak doesn't look as flashy as these guys and all this sort of stuff. Uh, Novak is more skilled than both of those players. Party as well, that goes a long way. So Rafa Nadal is still not finished. He's going to play his final season next season. No, Rafa Nadal is finished. <laughs> Rafi Nadal has been finished pretty much ever since last year when he ended up losing that U.S. Open to Francis uh, Tiafo, uh, whatever, whatever that man's name was. His, his career pretty much ended right there in terms of actually competing for that a Grand Slams. Now, who knows? He could win another French Open. I doubt it, just in my personal view, because Rafi Nadal within that last year in 2022, he looked done. This stat is quite pertinent in this one because if you look at the percentage of matches won at Grand Slams, the two of them are top of the pops on 88%. If Nadal comes in fully fit next season, that might slightly change. You mentioned you think Djokovic has got a... And the thing is about Rafi Nadal, uh, you know, about that 88%, and I'm assuming that that's what they're talking about, their full career winning percentage. And, you know, certain people may use that to debate Rafi Nadal and they'll say, oh, well, you know... Take a look, because Rafi Nadal, you know, he has the same winning percentage as Djokovic. Uh, and they might also use that, uh, you know, to put him over Roger Federer. The thing about Rafi Nadal is that Rafi Nadal is a great specialist. He, of course, is great on other surfaces. But when you talk about the clay court, he's exceptional, exceptional, exceptional on the clay court. And then other surfaces, you know, he's kind of just, you know, great. He's He's not you know, all-time great on those surfaces. Novak Djokovic and Roger Federer, they were both all-time great on both hard courts and out of grass courts. I think that Rafi Nadal, just in my personal view, he was only all-time great on, you know, at least when you compare him to those two players, he was only all-time great on just one surface. And that's kind of the thing about Rafi Nadal. Now, certain people, once again, they may say, well, that's not fair. Uh, he won four U.S. Open titles. Uh, you know, he also uh, won that of two Wimbledon titles. Are you saying that he's not all-time great? On those surfaces well it could be debatable and the reason why i say that is because unless we're talking about the u.s open rafi nadal in the australian open for example he loses to a lot of contenders and there was a reason why until uh you know they pulled off you know that heist of banning novak djokovic once again uh in the australian open why he didn't beat a lot of the contenders for a very long time you know like he would lose to stefano Tsitsipas, he would lose to that of dominic team 
he would lose to that of other players. Uh, you know, Rafi Nadal, he is not great on the Australian Open. He never has been. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk about that of Novak Djokovic and Roger Federer, they were both great in the Australian Open. Now, that being said, Rafi Nadal does have a winning record over Roger Federer and that of the Australian Open. But in terms of winning titles, no, R Rafi Nadal has never been all-time great at the Australian Open. And I've already stated this a multitude of times. In my view, Rafi Nadal still only has one Australian Open title. I'm sorry, but I don't count that second one. <laughs> if, if Roger Federer was banned because of a vaccine in the mid-2000s and wasn't allowed to go to the Wimbledon, and that player ended up winning the Wimbledon, none of the Roger Federer fans, none of the tennis media would count that Wimbledon title. I mean, you could if you want to. And if you count, you know, uh, that title, then hey, it's up to you because he still did beat Daniel Medvedev, the runner-up. I get it. But in my view, that's just not something that I count. Uh, you know, it's different had Novak Djokovic been injured and had he had to have pulled out. But the fact that it was because of the vaccine situation when they had just let him in the two years prior made no goddamn sense. So they were very clearly, in my view, trying to get Rafi Nadal to try and win that title. Couple in the tank. How do you think they'll ultimately end up on that statistic? Well, I think if Rafa's like fully fit for French Open, I mean, he's going to be, be a, targeting a strong favourite. Yeah, absolutely. I think on the hard courts, the difficulty is with his knees, his feet. He's had so many difficulties and injuries there. It might be too much for him expecting so much on the, on the hard courts. Then again, you never know. He's had the time now to rest, to recuperate, get fit again. But at the end of the day, again, I think there's almost too many young guys as well coming through. We see Zverev, we see... Alcaraz, Medvedev again, people like Runa, they're all so dangerous. Alexander Zverev, um, and I like Zverev, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, Zverev, Zverev is a guy that he's almost like that of the Dak Prescott or the Kirk Cousins of that of tennis. Or maybe I don't want to quite compare him to that, but he's almost like that of the Philip Rivers to where, you know, yeah, he has some great moments, but he's never going to be a guy that is ever going to beat the creme de la creme. I mean, yeah, he might put more wear and tear on Djokovic's career or something like that, if you want to make that argument, you know, to, to where it will uh, decrease Djokovic's longevity. But in terms of winning titles, I, I pretty much got off the sphere of hype train a couple years ago. It's no offense, but every time that I see him against an elite caliber player that has an actual chance of winning the championship, he almost never wins. And can they cause an upset? No doubt. So those names that you've mentioned there, the, the young bucks that are coming through, do they match the calibre of opponent that, say, Federer and Nadal would have played in their peak years? I think so. I think so on a one-off occasion. I think that what they are struggling to do is to replicate that match-in, match-out, torment after torment. We see them hit the highs, but then suddenly a week or two, then maybe we're not seeing them so much. Novak Djokovic, Nadal, even Serena and Roger, they were there every single week. They just were so resilient and that's what's incredible about them is the ability to do that for years and years as well so on a one-off 100 percent alex Zverev can you know beat anybody he's that good and alcaraz we've obviously seen he well we'll see about that as swear of as fair of if you want to talk about a younger player that can potentially beat anybody maybe someone like that of a yannick sinner you know the italian or maybe certain other players like that so Zverev cannot beat anybody i mean he he looks like he has a talent but he just mentally folds in every single big game that I've ever seen him play. Has beat them all. So that's why I compare him to the Kirk Cousins of, of that of tennis. Because Kirk Cousins is a guy that if you take a look at him on the surface, he's very talented in certain areas and he's statistically okay. But when you take a look at his games and the success that he has, it's been very little against that of the great competitors because he, he's very mentally weak. Every time he goes up against a great competitor, he mentally folds. It's just a question of the maturity that they'll face, that they have to kind of bring out of themselves to be able to do that on a... I mean, because even if we're talking about Sparev, I can't even put him over someone like a Stefano Tsitsipas. <laughs> because Stefano Tsitsipas, he's at least made a couple of Grand Slam finals. Sparev has only made one. You know, he only made one. And to be quite honest with you, had Novak Djokovic been uh, not eliminated because of that stupid move that he made when he hit the ball and hit the line judge... He, you know, had he met up with Djokovic, he, he probably would have not made it again. More often and on a more regular basis. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that Djokovic, you think, will at least go on and win one, maybe two more uh, Grand Slams. We'll, we'll therefore see this again. He's got the number 24 emblazoned on his chest. 
Is his greatest foe, as we move forward, time, wear and tear to his body? I think so. I think he's going to have to be really strategic. I think so as well. I do think that the greatest foe is going to be time. Uh, Novak Djokovic is going to have to make some decisions. That means that in order to possibly win more Grand Slams, he is more than likely going to have to sacrifice that number one spot because you're not going to be able to compete in a lot of these tournaments and still remain, uh, you know, as long, you know, in terms of the longevity. You know, you're not going to be as long-lasting if you compete in a lot of these tournaments. But I think that Novak Djokovic understands that. Uh, I think that he understands that, and I think that, uh, you know, he is probably not competing in as many of the main tournaments anymore. Uh, so we'll, we'll see about that because we kind of already did see that this year. About the tournaments he plays, we saw this year that he didn't go to Canada to play one of the Masters series. He, he wants to preserve his fitness levels. He can't go out there and play 24 weeks of the year. It's just too much. So we saw very much like that Serena at the very end of her career. She was just only almost prioritizing Grand Slams. We'll probably see that more and more from Djokovic. So enjoy him while he's still at the very peak of the game and playing regularly as well. I can't let you go, Don, without asking you for your, your favorite moments. We've really enjoyed the US Open, back live on Sky Sports. I'm going to ask you for three. So give us your first, your favorite of your, or your third favorite. Third favorite. Three moments. Um, okay, I'll start with, I, re, I mean, I really love <laughs> when he played Ben Shelton. He did the old phone, the phone, phone down, down on, him. on him, you know, after... Uh, after Shelton had did it in, in Tiafo's match, you know, sometimes you're going you're gonna to show that kind of stuff. You've got to be able to back it up. And, uh, well, Djokovic. He... Francis Tiafo, another kid that, in my view, you know, he, he's a little bit tough, but he'll never win a Grand Slam, in my view. Not, not against any elite players. He might win a Grand Slam, you know, if he's lucky, if a lot of the elite guys get outdueled. Uh, and I, I don't think that it's necessarily that... Uh, he mentally folds. I just don't think that he has the skill set of some of those other players. Just in my view. But we'll see. He says, listen, you're not having me on today, so uh, phone down. See you later, Alligator. And to be fair to Ben Shelton, he took it well, didn't he? He said, you know... That new kid, Ben Shelton, though, I'll tell you what, he has a lot of potential. And I, I have no doubt about it that <laughs> they've been planning to, uh, you know, popularize him for a very long time. So uh, don't be surprised if you see him in a lot of commercials or you know, him in the Grand Slam race later on. It seems like the next uh, assets or the next guys that they're going to be trying to push, uh, probably Holger Rune, uh, you know, uh, Ben Shelton, Carlos Alcaraz. You know, there might be another one that I'm forgetting. Of course, for women's tennis, Coco Golf. So we'll see. Imitation is the best form of flattery. Favorite moment number two? I actually got to say I really loved when Coco Golf in her speech afterwards, she talked about people putting water on her flames, but instead they were pouring gas on there. I just thought that really showed her maturity. You know, so now she's saying that she's bright, burning bright. I just love that story, the way she said it. Um, and it just goes to show that it's such a big moment for her career. And I think it's just going to be the blossoming start of a really, really... And congrats on Miss Coco Goff for winning her first Grand Slam. Uh, she was very patient, uh, cool and calculated in the final two sets. So a lot of credit to her. Sabalenka, by the way, in that final, by the way, was terrible. Uh, she was very good in the first set, uh, but but in those final two sets, she was terrible. Her serve was all over the place. She was hitting it out uh, by a couple feet, you know, every once in a while, you know. Uh, well, really not even every once in a while, almost on, you know, uh, on a lot of points. You know, she would hit it into the net a whole lot. And listen, I understand you're playing a great player in Coco Golf, but she was terrible. <laughs> you know, exceptional career. Okay, so your third favorite was ultimately the men's champion. Your second was the women's champion. What's your favourite moment of the last two weeks at Flushing Meadows? And I think this time I'm going to look at a shot and or actually a point, and it's Alcaraz versus Evans. I mean, that rally that they produced there, I think Evans thought he'd won that point about three times. And, and Alcaraz, I mean, the guy is an absolute beast. He's running side to side, covering so much court. Evans has probably thought he's done enough there, let alone on a volley. And then, oh. that, I mean, that is incredible. <laughs> and, and Evan's face, when it cuts to it, if we get to see it. Well, Evan's threw his racket because he literally, <laughs> his face there is saying, I have no idea what more I can I do. I can't do anything no. against this guy. He's like a tennis computer. <laughs> brilliant. Well, Dom, thank you for all of your reflections on a brilliant champion, a brilliant two weeks, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers. Thank you. But anyways, that's pretty much about it. In terms of that last part about Carlos Alcaraz, Carlos Alcaraz, within that, he does remind me a little bit of Rafael Nadal, where Rafael Nadal will fight every inch for every point. 
but it can wear you down a little bit over time with that type of play style because you're not supposed to play every single point like it's your last in every single part of the match. You will sometimes have to give up certain points or you will at times kind of have to pace yourself like that of a triathlon or like that of a race. So, you know, you got to be careful. So Carlos Alcaraz, don't be surprised if you see him get a few injuries or a lot of injuries just like that of Rafael Nadal. Uh, you know, and maybe get worn out a little bit earlier in his career than what some other athletes have been used to, you know, because he does play a very exciting style of tennis, but it also might create a little bit more wear and tear. And Djokovic has also at times fought for a good amount of points, but Djokovic also knows when to conserve his energy, you know, and also knows how to let you capitalize on your own, or, you know, him capitalize on your mistakes. So, you know, we'll see. But anyways, that's pretty much about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you later, and we'll see what Mr. Novak Djokovic is going to do next.